Hey everyone, welcome to another Shop Talk Live. Glad everyone could join us today. Uh, if one of my moderators would, uh, let me know how my audio sounds, uh, just to make sure uh, that you guys are hearing and seeing me okay. Uh, for those of you who are new to Shop Talk Live, this is a beginner series on keeping, raising, and breeding uh, Coternics. Uh, we go live every Friday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, this is a mini course uh, geared mainly towards those who are new to keeping Coternics, um, but even some of you more experienced uh, quail keepers might find some of this interesting. Um, okay, Lauren says we sound good. Okay, great. We'll go ahead and keep rolling on then. Um, for the most part, uh, like I said, this is a, a beginner series. Uh, this is kind of a, a little course outline uh, that I put together. Uh, this is by no means um, all the topics that we'll be covering. Um, but basically, it's, it's 30 minutes of me talking followed uh, by a Q&A session uh, afterwards. Um, I do want to say that uh, if you're just getting into quail, um, this is a list of equipment that and supplies that you might need, um, but the, probably the most important one on this list is right at the top, and that's research. Um, before you, you know, jump in head first, you know, and order up a bunch of hatching eggs, I would suggest, you know, doing your research uh, by, you know, you can start just by watching these videos. Um, but there's a lot of good sources out there um, on everything from hatching uh, to growing out to producing your own eggs and hatching birds from your eggs. Uh, also check out the uh, Caternix Corner Facebook group page. A lot of good information there. Um, a lot of good people that will help you, you know, in your journey. Also the uh, uh, Caternix Colors and Genetics page is a really good page. Uh, if you're having issues identifying birds, uh, you can post a picture of the bird. And there's always somebody in there that will jump in and uh, help you out with that. So. <clears throat> uh, also, we do have a sponsor for tonight's show. It is Northwest Quail Farm. Um, they donate on a weekly basis uh, either this water system, uh, which comes with 10 of the half inch PVC tees, uh, 10 of the horizontal nipples, and a repair kit, um, or you have your choice of a starter pack of the quail egg cartons, uh, which you'll get 25 of those, plus they include 25 personalized labels um, to put inside the carton, uh, you know, for when you're selling or shipping eggs, whatever. Uh, plus you get uh, five pair of uh, quail egg scissors. So those are always handy to have. Okay, um, I think that's pretty much it for uh, what we get started with. Um, I do want to say the last segment that we, st um, we talked about sorting and culling your birds. Uh, we showed some of the different uh, things that you want to look for when you are going through your birds and uh, selecting those that you want to keep uh, for production or those that you want to call. Um, this segment we're going to be talking about setting up breeder groups, uh, breeding programs. We'll talk a little bit about uh, hen to uh, rooster ratios uh, and stuff like that. So let's go ahead. Uh, we'll jump right into it. <coughs> Uh, first off, like I said, last week we talked about uh, culling and sorting, and um, in this show we're going to talk, you know, a little bit about setting up your breeders. Um, probably, for the most part, most people start out with a feather sexable um, color of quail, um, like these uh, pharaohs here. Uh, some people call these browns, some call them feral, some call them wild color. They're pretty much basically all the same thing. Uh, and it's a really good bird to start with uh, because it, it's kind of like a utility type bird. You know, it, it's got good size for meat. Uh, they're also very prolific layers, good size eggs and everything. So, um, and some of you might want to get into, you know, some of the, the other colors. Uh, like picture here um, are some Italian hens um, you know if you <clears throat> if you're gonna just jump into it I would start out with stuff that's feather sexable that way you don't have to worry about sexing your birds right off the bat but uh, for the most part this is what we're gonna be talking about um, 
probably sorry I'm trying to read and, and talk at the same time here um, one of the first things that I recommend that you uh, sort for sort and select for is your males um, the male to me is one of the most important um, of the breeding group uh, because he is going to be passing his genetics onto all your hens and then in turn onto all the offspring that they produce so you you definitely want to make sure you know that you've got uh, you know some really nice roosters you want to make sure that they meet all the conformity which we talked about in the previous segment um, and then you know if they meet all the conformity they meet the weight uh, then just you know look at them for uh, you know color some some roosters may be a little bit nicer color you know in your eyes um, these here are all basic pharaohs they look like they're mostly sex link brown I don't even see anything in there that could be considered uh, clean or heterozygous clean so um, I would probably on something like this select the the roosters that have more of a white chin strap as long as everything else is good on them um, I would you know want to get something that's a little bit cleaner in the face um, I don't really see any that are, are too dark um, but anyhow it's going to be the males that are going to uh, basically determine the further genetics in your line so you want to be really picky when when selecting your males uh, also if you are um, setting up your breeder groups if you are more interested in the color lines uh, if they meet all the conformity then you're going to want to select like say your hens you want to go through and select the hens that are uh, for the most part you know nicer colored or have you know better patterning uh, and I do want to say again, I said this in the last show, that um, because there is no standard or perfection for quail, there is no real um, color or patterning, I guess. Uh, so it, it's basically going to be personal preference as far as that goes. Um, as long as they meet conformity, you know, they're healthy, uh, good weight, good build, good type, um, then, you know, the color you can you can choose by your preference um, like I say again a lot of you will probably be jumping into like a jumbo ferro line uh, because uh, basically they're a uh, you know a good meat all around egg layers and that's usually what most people get started with uh, before they go jumping into other colors okay so uh, you, you've grown out your birds, you've selected your breeders, now you need to come up with uh, what you're going to be keeping them in. And for the most part, breeding groups are usually set up in layer cages. And the only difference between a grow-out pen and a layer cage is that the um, layer cages have a sloped floor with a roll-out uh, egg collection tray that extends out from the front of the um, cage so you can easily collect the eggs. It also helps uh, in keeping the eggs clean, it also helps in keeping the eggs uh, safe. That you're not having your birds kicking the eggs around, you know, and getting them cracked or broken. Um, but you can get either the uh, commercial style cages, like we showed in the previous slide, or in this slide, these are some DIY all wire cages uh, that I built. I've got two styles there. The first one right behind me is actually a grow out cage, and the next two are layers, and then the farthest one is also another grow out. Um, but uh, there are also a lot of other uh, cages that you could use uh, as far as a layer system goes. We had uh, some cages that we built on the channel. Uh, they're the uh, wood framed uh, cages. I believe we had layer and grow up pens. Uh, we showed how to do that. Uh, but for those of you who want to get into it a little more seriously um, for production, um, you're probably going to want a larger cage. Um, for like a colony cage. Um, the cage on the left, that was built by Mark La Rochelle of the La Rochelle Farm. And Mark is, has a uh, breeding commitment coming up where he needs to produce, you know, X amount of eggs per week uh, in order to meet that uh, 
commitment of his. So he built these really nice cages. I mean, they're huge. I think he says they can hold 100 birds per layer. So in that unit alone, he can hold 400 uh, birds. So that's going to be um, well, a lot of eggs a week, you know. And then uh, for somebody smaller, you know, like uh, most of us, uh, we'll start out with a, a little bit smaller pen. The one behind me is the one that I started out with. It is uh, six foot wide by 20 inches deep, I believe. And uh, I think I put around 40 birds in each of those layers. Um, so, and that those worked out pretty good for me. But anyhow, the end, the end goal is to have a cage where uh, egg collecting is easy and basically safe for the eggs. You know, the eggs will roll away from the birds uh, and they are, you know, basically protected. Um, you can use a cage that's totally enclosed, uh, like a grow-up pen or even an aviary. You may have to collect your eggs more often just to keep uh, them from getting damaged. But uh, I would recommend, you know, going with something that's got a roll-out floor in it. Okay, um, I will talk a little bit about um, some of the different lines. Uh, again, this is a Jumbo Ferro line, which is probably going to be what most of you will be jumping into, uh, at least right off the bat. Um, basically, you want to set up uh, breeding groups of X amount of roosters to X amount of hens, and we're going to go into talk a little bit more about that in a minute uh, but these are the pharaohs um, some of you may be more interested like I say in the colored birds um, these are some fawn or uh, Italians and I believe there's some Manchurians in there also uh, <clears throat> those are some other lines that you may want to get into uh, or if you're into a real specific breeding project um, these are some black quail that uh, I actually hatched out from some eggs that I got from William Carl Foster. Uh, they were in his black tuxedo line and uh, they were for the most part pretty neat birds. I mean you can see I've got I was already sorting this batch out to keep breeders. Uh, you can see the ones with the tags on them. Uh, those were were selected to be added to my breeding program. Um, this is just another shot of the same birds. Uh, but this is one of the projects I'm working on right now. Um, it is a pansy line. I'm, I'm trying to, uh, I won't say clean up the line because it's not really cleaning up. It's, I'm breeding for color that I prefer in my pansies. A lot of people like, you know, a pansy that's really dark, got a lot of black marking on the back. I'm the opposite. I like it a little bit lighter. Um, something more like maybe an Italian look to it. But uh, that's the way I like my pansies. And I have these guys paired up with just, you know, one hen and one rooster because they were the only two that exhibited that uh, style of patterning that I like. Uh, here's another project that I'm working on. It is the, uh, actually it's a first time project for me. These are the calicos that Michael Rose sent me. Um, I believe I have these guys set up in a one to five ratio pen. Uh, but that's just another one that I'm working on. Okay, let's talk about a little bit about getting your birds out of the grow out and into your breeding groups. Um, first off, you're gonna notice in your grow outs, once your birds reach uh, between five, six, eight weeks, um, that their behavior is gonna change a little bit. Your roosters are going to be crowing, like the one here on the left. Um, they basically stand up tall and make their, their crazy little crow sound. Um, that is a good, a good time uh, if you don't have feather sexable birds to go ahead and sort them out um, if you're not you know really good at, at uh, vent sexing um, also uh, where was I at here oh you may see you really can't see it because behind me I don't think hold on let me get out of the way um, some of your hens may start laying eggs inside the, uh, the grow out cages. So at that time, uh, that's a good signal for you to uh, go ahead and start sorting your birds, getting them ready to put into uh, your different breeding projects. And uh, 
let's see we're going to talk a little bit now about uh, ratios um, for the most part I'm seeing a lot of people doing colony uh, cages which is basically where you set up um, a lot of hens in an individual cage and add uh, your roosters according to the ratio that you want and I did start out doing that back when I first got into quail I would put like you know 20 hens in a cage and maybe three or four roosters um, I don't do that practice much anymore I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with it a lot of guys that are on the the uh, production side of it you know they, they need to produce a lot of eggs or a lot of meat um, that is probably the most you know feasible way for them to do it um, I really don't work that way anymore I kind of set up uh, my individual um, cages with a ratio that I want um, like in this cage here this is uh, small so uh, some of my other uh, pansies they are in a one to five ratio cage and uh, that's basically where they will stay it's one rooster <coughs> per cage <coughs> excuse me I gotta get a drink here my throat is killing me it's one rooster per cage with his group of hens um, the ratio of birds kind of varies um, a lot of people will say you know a one to five ratio is optimal I've tried everything from you know one to one to one to ten um, for the most part that works well where you where I seem to run into problem or where I have run into problem before was uh, if you had just say 20 birds in a cage and three roosters uh, that's where it seems that you know some aggression issues can arise you get you know some roosters that just are idiots <laughs> and they want to they want all the hens for themselves so they try to take out the other roosters occasionally you'll get a, a, a really aggressive hen and she'll beat up on the roosters so for me it has worked much better putting one rooster per cage and then depending on what breeding project I'm working on that determines the number of hens like you saw in that picture earlier of the the two pansies with the lighter markings those were the only two I had so I did a one-to-one -one ratio in that cage this cage here is a one to three ratio uh, I believe the bird directly behind me is the rooster and then you've got three hens over here on this side uh, here's another cage um, I think this is actually a one to a one to two ratio cage uh, again because I, I selected the birds that I wanted in with that rooster it's just a lot easier for me to keep track of the eggs I know which cage they came from if I got a you know just say I had two hen or two roosters and ten hens one I wouldn't know which rooster bred with the hen that I'm collecting the eggs from I also I have no clue which uh, hens laid the eggs so uh, for me it's you know one single rooster per cage you know I know people that are into the production end of things are going to disagree with me but um, I am no longer doing production I actually I never did do production but um, to me the uh, the single male per cage works out the best okay I want to talk a little bit about uh, birds per square foot next we're going to go back uh, to this one here um, there are a lot of people are, are saying that three birds I've even heard three and a half birds per square foot is optimal again that's another thing that I don't agree with um, I didn't I didn't find that keeping more birds packed in tight does a better job as far as keeping down aggression or keeping you know hens bred uh, I get very very little aggression I don't, I don't think I've had a case of aggression in probably you know a couple of months anyhow um, keeping my birds like this for the most part my birds get you know one square foot or more per bird um, let's see these cages are uh, 18 by 20 inches deep so that's a foot and a half by foot and a half so that would be what uh, four and a half square feet 
I think. But anyhow, there, there's four birds in there, so they're getting you know one square foot per bird. And these guys got a, the whole pen to themselves, so they're doing really good. All right, I want to talk a little bit about uh, changing your feed uh, from the time that you are in the grow out stages into the uh, uh, layer stages or the uh, the breeding stages. Uh, basically, what I do is my birds are raised on a 30% game bird uh, formula from the time they hatch up until the time they start laying eggs, at which time I switch them over to a 16% protein. Uh, it's just a standard uh, chicken formula made for chicks or chickens, um, hens, I guess I should say. Um, around me, I can't find any game bird, any uh, layer formula specifically formulated for game birds so i've used the uh, chicken formula and it's worked fine i've been using it you know for better than three years and uh all my adult birds you know have done fine on it you know they all seem healthy don't have any issues with you know soft shells or anything but if you do have issues with soft shells it's usually because they are lacking uh in calcium so what you want to do is uh, supplement your hens with either oyster shell or recently I just got some stuff sent to me by Grubterra, black soldier fly larva. Uh, that is uh, three to five percent protein, I'm sorry, three to five percent calcium, 70 percent more calcium than a mealworm contains. So in your regular layer formula, I believe it's like two and a half to three percent uh and the black soldier fly larva is up to five so that's uh you know will give them a good calcium boost they need um, i wouldn't recommend offering that oyster shell to them all the time you don't want the hens uh to start laying eggs that are uh, that get you know like calcium deposits on the eggs over calcified i call it um, also it could uh, create an egg shell that's uh too hard for the chick to actually pip and break out of. So, also I want to talk again about aggression. We talked about aggression in the last uh, video or the last segment, uh, but I want to talk to you a little bit about it in this one. Um, any aggression that I find in my flock, the birds automatically call. There's no second chances. I don't put them in a timeout cage or anything. Um, the aggressor always gets called, and the bird that uh, was beaten up, if, they, if they've scalped or, like this case, got the eye plucked out, um, they are also called. Um, don't confuse um, aggression or pecking order with aggression. Um, you will have in your group, you know, you'll have your little spats between birds. They're basically just, you know, setting the pecking order of their group. Um, also, don't confuse breeding behavior with uh, aggression. Now, if you, you look at these three hens, uh, every one of them has a bald head. And, you know, some people say, oh, my males are, are aggressive. You know, they're scalping the birds. These birds aren't really scalped. They just had their feathers pulled out by the rooster uh, from, you know, being bred. Um, Sometimes that will extend down the neck and onto the back. It, it's no big deal. It's just, you know, some roosters aren't as graceful, I guess as you'd say, uh, and they have to really hang on to the hen, and sometimes it results in feathers getting pulled or, you know, back feathers getting ruffled or actually I've had hens that were almost bare back, and it wasn't from feather pulling. It was from a rooster that just for some reason couldn't balance himself on their back, and he was basically clawing some feathers out. So... Um, don't confuse uh, breeding behavior with aggression. Uh, but anyhow, your end goal is to get your uh, birds laying and uh, producing eggs so you guys can uh, carry on with your projects or, you know, provide hatching eggs, shipping, uh, eating eggs, whatnot. Um, what did I want to talk about this? Um, I want to talk a little bit about... Um, rotating your birds uh, as far as a breeding program goes. Um, a lot of people are concerned that if you uh, line breed or inbreed uh, coturnix that you're going to run into you know genetic problems, deformities and whatnot. Uh, it's possible after several generations uh, but for the most part um, I think that coturnix have 
especially if you got your eggs from a, a larger breeder, they've got enough stock in their cages that, you know, it's uh, kind of a diversified gene pool. Uh, you should be pretty good to go for a while. Um, but there is a system that a lot of people recommend. It's called the uh, clan mating system or the spiral breeding program. And basically what you're doing is taking your roosters from one group and breeding them to the hens of another group. And same with this one, like you got the blue hen moving into the green group, green hen moving into the yellow group, yellow, or I'm sorry, yellow, green rooster moving into the yellow group, and then yellow rooster moving into the blue group. And uh, that will keep your gene pool diversified. I think I read that uh, you can go 20 plus generations using this spiral breeding program before you really need to, you know, start thinking about breeding in, bringing in new blood. Uh, the one behind me, uh, basically it shows the first year, uh, then it shows all subsequent years. You guys can do a search on, on Google. Um, they will uh, just do a search for uh, spiral breeding and all this stuff will come up. I actually stole this off of Google, don't tell nobody. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, uh, in your breeding program, you also want to tag your birds. Um, if you go back, like we've got the, the green, yellow, and blue, uh, you can use uh, either leg bands or what I use, these little four inch zip ties of different colors. Uh, I use both their legs when I tag. Uh, the left leg will be for uh, the group that they're from or the breeder that they're from. Uh, and then the right leg uh, will be for birds so I know what uh, mutations they might be carrying, uh, if they're het for something or, um, yeah, that's basically my designator leg, I call it. So that works out pretty good. Another thing you really wanna do uh, once you start breeding projects is keep very good records. Um, these cards were uh, made by uh, John and Anita Garrett of AJ Farms LLC. And they sent me out a bunch of them. I have, actually hang, have them hanging on my cages now. And uh, you can pretty much put whatever pertinent information you need on there, like where they're from, the color, uh, the date they were hatched out, laying date. I would add on there, I probably wouldn't use the uh, dispatch call. I would probably use that uh, so I know where the roosters from one group went to the, uh, the different color group. Uh, but anyhow, we get to the, uh, our whole end goal of this thing. You know, we started out in this series, you know, ordering hatching eggs and then uh, incubating them, brooding them, growing them out, and now we're into breeding and our end goal is obviously uh, production of producing eggs uh, to either produce more birds or grow up birds to produce meat. Um, that you can see here, or you can be collecting eggs to uh, start a whole new generation. Um, you know, breeding or incubating the eggs that uh, your birds produced. Uh, or you may be collecting eggs for selling and eating. Um, so anyhow, that brings us, you know, pretty much full circle. We're back to where we started with. Um, there was some other stuff I know I wanted to talk about. Oh, as far as... Uh, As far as um, ratios, I want to talk a little bit more about ratios. Like I said, I can do anywhere from a one to one up to a one to six, even a one to seven ratio and still get good fertility rates. I don't have any issues with it. Um, some people say if you get over one to five, your fertility is going to start, start dropping down. I haven't really found that. Um, I've actually had some cages where I've, I've done a one to 10 and my birds were still all laying, you know, fertile eggs. So, um, yeah. And then on colonies, colony ratios, uh, like I say, if you've got a large pen where say you got, you know, a hundred birds in there, uh, obviously one rooster can't service a hundred birds. So you're going to need like 20 roosters in there, uh, just to give you a one to five ratio. Um, in my experience, I've, I've run into issues doing that. I mean, I know a lot of big breeders do it. You know, they have to just because they have so many birds and they're producing so many eggs that that's the only way they could do it. They couldn't feasibly, you know, have an individual cage for every, uh, you know, one to five or one to 10 even. Um, 
But, you know, I guess it's, it's going to be what you are looking to do with your quail. Uh, I have kind of totally switched my, uh, the reasoning why I'm keeping quail anymore. It used to be, you know, I was trying to produce as many birds as I can for eggs, meat, and whatnot. Uh, I'm no longer doing that. Uh, I am basically uh, just trying to clean up lines. And all I'm concerned about this year is producing uh, eggs from birds that are going to produce the offspring that I am trying to to come up with. So um, that's about all I really have to say on this topic. But let's go ahead and jump into the chat room, see if you guys don't have any uh, questions for me. Um, if you guys would, put the letter Q by your question. Well, actually, it doesn't matter if you do that, because I'm just going to start right at the top and read down through. It doesn't look like we've got a whole lot in here today anyhow, so. Um, let's see, our moderator, Lauren's in the house. Good evening, all. Glad you could make it, Lauren. Thank you. Uh, Ed says, hey, hey, all from Southern California. Day two of my first lockdown with eggs from Southwest Game Birds. 49 candle good, nine head shells too dark to tell, and four with no development. Congratulations. Sounds like a pretty decent hatch. Sue says, hello from Ohio. Uh, Peter says, good day from Oz. Uh, Lauren says, that's great, Ed. Gary's in the house is Howdy. Oh, talking to Lauren. Howdy, Lauren from Nebraska. There's our other moderator, Henriette. Welcome. Good evening, all. Adirondack Coil and Duck Ranch says, Charlie, I guess, says hello, all. Uh, let's see, not talking to me. Mark's in the house. Hello, all from good old Connecticut. Mark here. Welcome, Mark. Glad you can make it. Mark charged me a dollar to use that picture of his cage. Thanks, Mark. No, he didn't really charge me. I told him to put it on my bill. Margaret and John says, uh, hello, everyone from the Missouri Ozarks. Welcome. Glad you can make it. Joy says, hello, all from Western Oregon. Karen says, hello. Hello, Karen from Holly Springs, Mississippi. Robert White says, just started lockdown with 156 Bob White Northern eggs. Cool. Uh, Lauren says we sound good. Al's here from Ohio. Welcome, Al. Jason Dyer's in the house. It's good evening, all. Looking forward to the next installment of the Beginners series. Uh, yeah, actually, um, what we're going to do now, let me bring that, that uh, image up again. We, we've done six, uh, six courses already, I guess we call them, uh, where we started out, you know, getting hatching eggs, um, incubating them, brooding them, uh, sorting and culling, and now uh, setting up breeder groups. What we're going to do from here forward is go into a little bit more in depth on some of the various things. Like one of the big ones that I got was uh, humidity, temperature and humidity. I get a lot of questions on that. Um, we'll probably uh, maybe do one on strictly on uh, sexing birds, you know, whether it's uh, uh, feather sexable varieties or vent sexing, uh, stuff like that. And I've got other topics that uh, I have, you know, written on a on a file on my computer that uh, I'll go over them too. So, but anyhow, yeah, we're going to start going jumping in a little more in depth into some of this stuff. Um, for the first six, I just kind of did a broad overview of everything, just to give you a good, uh, you know, give you an understanding of what each topic uh, is going to entail. Michelle says, good afternoon. Welcome, Michelle. Glad you could make it. Henriette says, 72 out of 93 babies hatched today. I did see the, the picture you posted or the little video you posted. Congratulations. Tech C2022 says, thank you for doing this. Absolutely. Anthony says, thank you, sir. I need all the help I can get. You're not the only one, man. I need help, too. Brand Billinger says, hey, 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 newbie here from Ontario, Canada. Welcome. Glad you could join us. Henriette says, welcome to the newcomers. Uh, Aura Johnson says, hello, everyone from Alabama. Tony's in the house. Hello from Canada. Okay, Tony's in here from Toronto. I, I remember that from last week. Uh, not talking to us.
Joy Guthrie says, I've looked at my feral birds and noticed that there is a difference in some of their colors. Some are more red than others. I like the red coloring. Yeah, the, the red Joy is basically, um, they carry the sex link brown uh, mutation, uh, which gives them that, that like reddish orange uh, coloration. Um, and it's per I'm actually trying to breed that out of my line, but it's perfectly fine to have that in a line. Um, a lot of people prefer it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you like it, go for it. Bags of Love says, hello all from North Carolina. Uh, Sean says, is there a reason for both grow-out cages and egg roll-out cages? Seems like you, could, you should be able to do both in an egg roll-out cage. Absolutely, you can. Um... Uh, egg rollout cage is just going to have a slope floor. You'll have to block it off until the birds, you know, are, are large enough to where they can't uh, squeeze out underneath it. I've actually done it before uh, in my wood frame cages. I would use a layer cage as a grow out because I didn't have enough grow out cages. Um, yes, it does work. You just have to block the opening. Uh, Susan says again, thank you for the series. Absolutely. Uh, Lewis says hello from Albany, Louisiana. Uh, La Rochelle Farm says, almost done with the plumbing today. Cool. Send me some more pictures, as long as you don't charge me, Mark. <laughs> uh, Mark also says, I'm enjoying the build. Uh, let's see. Michelle says, uh, looking at your blacks, when you start with tuxedo, hard is, how hard is it to breed out that white? Um, well, white being recessive, it's it can take a while to breed it out. Um but I think who was it, Katia, that told me that being white, or maybe it was uh, it was either Katia or, uh, yeah, it was Katia. White being a recessive, it can pop up at any time. You know, you could go several generations and never see it, and then it just pops up again. So, um, yeah, I don't have the blacks anymore. They actually went to a friend of mine uh, who was actually taking care of all my birds while I was out of town. And he ended up in the hospital and he lost all his birds and the uh, the ones that he was taking care of for me. So and that was back in the, when COVID was rampant. Uh, let's see, Texi says, does anyone know what to do with the heads, feathers, skin, feet when you call? Um, I mean, I basically just usually just trash most of it, but I'm just trying to think of some stuff that you could do with it. Uh, feathers, check with, you know, there's uh, fly tires uh, that use them for fishing, um, some of the feathers. Um, the feet, I've heard of people feeding them to their dogs. Um, but for the most part, I just, you know, either bury them or put them out with the trash. <clears throat> Joy Guthrie says, beautiful birds, Terry. <clears throat> Henriette says, hello, Terry's dog just barked and now my dog went ballistic. I didn't even hear mine bark this. I'm, I'm just so used to hearing it, I didn't. Uh... Okay, Lauren says, uh, same thing. I feed them to my dog or compost them, okay? Henriette says, question, Terry, what do you do when the bird's beak gets too long? And what do you think is the cause of it? Because uh, I have three females with really long beaks. We clip them, and it seems they just keep growing. Okay, I, I have two uh, trains of thought on that. One, I think that, or uh, one, I know that uh, because the birds don't have anything to rub against and keep their birds, their beaks trimmed up themselves, you know, like, you know, in the wild, they'd be pecking at the ground and rocks and whatnot, and that would help them keep their beaks uh, uniform uh, but in captivity and here we go back to breeding again and genetics um, because I have birds I mean literally hundreds of hens that I haven't seen a, a, a long or an overgrown beak in a long long time um, so again I go back to genetics it could be you know it could be something that they're carrying that you know just the long beak, <laughs> the long beak gene, I guess you'd call it, but um, yeah, try putting something in your cage that, you know, like a small rock or a, or a 
piece of a brick or something, something that they can peck at to uh, help trim that up. Um, you shouldn't have to keep trimming a bird's beak. You know, it should stay uh, the length it needs to be. Let's see. Not talking to me. Uh, Arizona Highland Homestead says, howdy yo. And he says, I was planning on raising mealworms, so you don't recommend mealworms. Um, no, I am just saying that uh, the Grub Terra Company um, sent me the black, dried black soldier fly larva and said that they are 70, they contain 70% more calcium. So, I mean, mealworms is, is fine for a treat. I, I don't think, uh, I mean, you're, you're not going to hurt your birds, I don't think, by feeding them. I wouldn't overfeed them. I wouldn't make it a, you know, a source of, of food all the time you know but maybe as a treat it'll be okay uh but if you're if you're worried about like you know boosting up calcium you know maybe look into the black soldier fly larva but no i mean if you want to if you want to raise mealworms for a treat for your birds that's absolutely fine i'm sure they would love it <coughs> mark says i've just started uh mixing layer crumbles with broiler feed this helps bring the protein level up to about 18 percent and gets the calcium into the two percent range which I think are ideal levels. Um, yeah, I mean, 18% protein's fine. Um, with mine, I found that 16% protein's more than enough. Uh, when, when you butcher birds, especially a little bit older birds, and you see a lot of fat deposits on them, that's because you're, you know, you're pumping that protein to them. Uh, they really don't need a lot of protein once they've uh, basically stopped growing. Um, and the calcium in the two percent range is, is about perfect. That, I think they say anywhere between two and three percent is the range that you want to be into our for calcium. So, yeah, sounds like you're you're doing it right there, Mark. Arizona Highland Homestead just took a screenshot for future reference. I don't know what screenshot you were talking about, but okay. Uh, KLP says late coming in tonight. That's okay. Bars Farms says, hello, everyone. I'm late as always. I hear you. Travis and Tracy Prill says, what are your thoughts on using bedding? Um, you mean as far as like uh, pine shavings or something? Um, I know a lot of people that do. Um, I, I keep my birds on wire uh, mainly for the ease of cleaning. Uh, it just makes cleaning a lot easier for me. But I know, you know, several people that uh, have their birds set up to where, you know, part of the pen is uh, like a sand bath. They, they have access to sand and the rest of the, the bed is uh, either pine shavings or, you know, natural bedding material. So, yeah, I mean, it's all personal preference, I guess. Uh, as long as you've got it set up to where it's easy for you to clean. Well, as a matter of fact, I've got, you know, basically bedding out of my aviary. I'm using the deep litter method and... Uh, it seems to be working, you know, pretty good for them. Sue says, at what age do you add the colored zip ties to the birds and how tight do you make it? I usually don't start tagging my birds until I do the first cull. Um, and then at that time, I'm just tagging birds that I want to keep an eye on. Um, the, the birds that don't make it through the first cull uh, usually go out into a meat pen, but the birds that I keep, um, they will have to go through a second call, which is when I select for my breeders. Uh, as far as how tight, I, it's, it's very loose. It, it's loose enough to where uh, it won't, or let's see, it, it's tight enough to where it won't slide past the feet uh, and fall off, but it's really loose. I mean, it's, it, it moves around. And he says, how many quail do you recommend to get started? I'm raising to feed my family and maybe to sell at the farmer's market. Um, if I were you, I would start out a little bit smaller because as fast as these things, you know, grow up and start producing eggs, you know, you're only, if you say you started out with 20 birds um, and you decided you wanted 50, it would only be a matter of a couple months before you're ready to start incubating eggs anyhow. And, uh, it doesn't take long to grow, believe me. <laughs> uh, Ed says, is there a good source of cartons or way of keeping jumbo quail eggs? Um, Ed, I use, let's see if I can bring that picture up real quick. I use these things right here. 
Um, they will hold a jumbo egg. Uh, some of the double yolkers, the really big ones, you know, probably, you know, 18, 19, 20 grams. They don't quite fit in there real good, but for the most part, those work. These work really good. And I picked these up. It was a set of six that I picked up off of uh, eBay for like, I want to say twelve dollars, something like that. They were really inexpensive, and they and they worked great so far. <clears throat> Arizona Highland Homestead said last night we put thirty nine eggs out of fifty from Southwest Game Birds into lockdown, assembling the hatching time cages now. Congratulations! Hope you get a good hatch. Peter says, Terry, do you get any overbreeding problems with a one to one ratio, and how long do you keep the pair together uh, before resting the hens? if you need to rest the hens. Um, no, not really. Uh, a lot of times if I'm doing a one-to-one, -one, like that picture that I showed you, um, they were pretty much raised up together. Uh, they were the only two in that group. Um, so I kind of set them aside. Um, and they are, the rooster is just now starting to show breeding behavior uh, and you know trying to mate with that hen. Um, but no, even even in other, you know, where I've got low ratios, unless I've got a real idiot for a rooster, um, with the exception of maybe, you know, the bald head pulling out the, the feathers on the head, I don't really have any, you know, overbreeding problems. Um, the only resting my hens will usually get is if I decide to pull a rooster. Um, I might let her lay eggs on her own for a couple weeks before introducing a different rooster with her just to get just so I know that when that when she's laying eggs I'm getting eggs that are fertilized from the second rooster instead of the first so. Lauren says headed out to put the kids good bed good luck to the winner um, thanks for joining us tonight Lauren appreciate it as always uh, Steven says, when eggs start to pip and then stop for over a day, is that okay? Yeah, a lot of times um, the, they will pip and they'll go, you know, 24 hours uh, and not do anything before they start unzipping the egg. So, yeah, just be patient. And Steven also says, hello all from Wyoming. The Rochelle Farm says, you're doing a nice job explaining this for beginners, Terry. Keep it up. I'm trying to keep it I'm trying to keep it dumbed down. I don't want to say dumbed down because it sounds like I'm looking down at people. I'm trying to keep it as basic as possible. Um, you know, I, I could go, there's a lot more, a lot of stuff that I could go into, but I, I really don't want to confuse you. And like I said earlier, there are going to be some stuff that we go into, which is going to target. Um, like another one I just thought of doing is, uh, you know, 30 minutes on ratios. Uh, talking about the different ratios and why you might want that ratio, why you might not want that ratio, stuff like that. So thanks, Mark. Appreciate the uh, vote of confidence there. Cooking Sherry is in the house. Uh, question, if I'm interested in breeding quail for special color eggs with meat production being secondary, what's the best type of Caternix to go with? Um, well, I mean, special color eggs, are you talking about like a celadon layer? Um, I... I don't know a whole lot about celadon layers. I mean, I know that a lot of the celadons are EBs, which is extended browns, your rosettas, Tibetans, or whatnot. But I am almost 100% sure that any color uh, can be a celadon layer. Um, so if I were you, I would start, I would, I would talk to some people that have celadon eggs, if that's what you're looking for. Um, talk to the people that carry the celadons and find out what color birds they're using to produce the celadon eggs and you know meat production being secondary that's not really an issue because you can always breed for size you know or call for size basically you just need to select your breeders the larger breeders uh, as long <laughs> as long as your larger breeders are actually 100% celadon carriers uh, it could be that could be fun, but I, I don't mess with with celadon, so I really can't, you know, give you a hundred percent accurate answer on that one. Chris says hello from Sandusky, Ohio. Hello, Bars Farms says, hey Terry, if you breed a jumbo brown to the jumbo whites, would you get 
a tuxedo jumbo, you will get a ferro tuxedo. And yes, it could be a jumbo. Jumbo is just a, a weight uh, differenti differentiator. Um, but yeah, you'll get, uh, if you breathe the, the pharaohs uh, to a, a white, you'll get a pharaoh tux. Not talking to me. Texie says, do you have a recommendation farm for the first time eggs or chicks in Texas? Check out Matt Heydrich. Um, I'm not sure exactly where he is in Texas. Um, I've ordered for him multiple times. Matt's always got some really nice, uh, you know, uniform eggs. They're all, you know, pretty decent sized eggs. I've always got good hatches out of Matt's, egg, Matt's uh, uh, hatching eggs. Um, I'm trying to think who else is in Texas. Uh, AJ, I, I'm, I'm, I don't want to say AJ Farms. A and J something. If you look on the Turner's Corner Facebook group page, do a, a search for uh, A and A and J something. I don't want to say AJ Farms LLC because that's um, John and Anita Garrett. You can order from them. They'll ship to Texas. You can order from Southwest Game Birds. They're in Arizona. They can easily ship to Texas also. But if you want uh, somebody in Texas, uh, Matt Heydrich would be my first recommendation. Pastime84 says, hello everyone from Mansfield, Texas. Sean Alexander says, uh, where do you get your watering cups? I can't find, I can find them on Amazon, but question quality. Um, there are two people that I order my watering cups from on Amazon. Oh, and I can't think of the name of either one of them right off the top of my head. Um, but I use, uh, Mark, if you're still in here, who, who are the people that we get the horizontal um, nipples from? I know I use the ones that you recommended to me, and they've been working good. But as far as the water cups, um, I, know, I know there's a lot of people out there that are selling them. Uh, for the most part, I've had pretty good luck with the two different suppliers that I've been using. Dell, Dell something sticks in my mind. D-E-L, Delmar something maybe. Um, but I think for the most part, all those are shipped in out of uh, China. Uh, what's, what's their store, their eBay store that they have? Uh, oh, I can't even think of the name off the top of my head. But I, I got a feeling that's where 90% of that stuff's coming from. It's just being repackaged for Amazon. Um, the nice thing about them is they're so easily repaired. Even if you do have an issue with them, you can take them apart and clean them up and usually get them working or take parts from other ones and you know, you know, make a working set. Uh, the biggest problem I had with them was uh, when I used to use them in all my cages, birds would actually perch up on top of them, press down that plunger and flood their cage. <laughs> so I had to build little wire uh, racks over top of them to keep the birds from doing that. Uh, William Babs says, hello from Texas. How long does molting normally last? Um, two to three weeks on average. I've had some birds go up to a month. Um, but I would say, you know, on average, probably right around two weeks. Uh, Rob, me too. Do you recommend to give vitamin drink for quail? I do. I start my chicks out. They get a vitamin electrolyte um, uh, additive into their water. I mix it about 50%. Um, I don't give it to them full strength. Uh, I give that to my chicks just to give them a little boost, you know, when they first uh, hatch out. Uh, I'll also give it to, you know, all my grow outs and my adult birds on extremely warm days. Uh, if I know, notice a lot of the birds in the quail room are panting heavily, I know, okay, it's pretty warm out. You know, I'll go ahead and give them, especially the electrolyte. I'm not so much worried about the vitamins because they're getting the vitamins from their feed. But the electrolyte seems to help, you know, to help them deal with the heat. Autumn says, I had 60 eggs incubating from a breeder and 30 eggs from another breeder. Two of 60 hatched. Only one egg had any development. All the others were nothing but yolk. And 12 of 30 hatched. Reason, not fertile. Well, I mean, if you had zero development, I'm going to guess that a lot of the eggs were infertile. 
um, unless you had a major, major issue with your incubator uh, to cause that many eggs to not develop at all. Uh, 12 out of 30, that's a little bit closer to, you know, being okay. I mean, 15 would have put you at 50%, but, um, and 50% is kind of normal for shipped eggs, if they were shipped eggs. Uh, but I would definitely contact the person you got them from and say, hey, what the heck, you know, two out of 60 eggs hatched, that's, something's not right there. Woman of Spirits in the House is blessing beautiful Coyo people. Glad you could join us today. Uh, Rob says, how old the quail live? Um, I've heard, you know, three or four years, or I've heard they'll lay up to two to three years and live up to three to four years. I've never tried to raise them up, you know, to their full lifespan. Uh, so I, I really don't know from personal experience. And he says, I'm in Texas and it gets very hot and humid in the summer. Will the summers be hard on the quail? I'm in Florida and it gets very hot and humid here, especially during our rainy season. Uh, and they do just fine. I have birds outside, I have birds inside. Um, granted, the birds inside do have air conditioning, so they're kind of spoiled, but um, yeah, they'll be fine. Uh, just keep them, you know, in the shade and preferably in a uh, enclosure that's got good ventilation. You can get good airflow through it uh, and they should do just fine. Uh, Taxi 2022 sent us a super chat, 499. Thank you very much. Um, I never ask for money on any of my live streams, um, but it is much appreciated. We put it right back into the channel uh, to make more videos for you guys. So, um, Taxi, thank you very much. Uh, Bars Farm says you can use a large piece of sandpaper. Oh, I guess for the uh, for the beak issue my if that's what you're talking about bars farm but my first thing would be and this is my own personal thoughts my first thing would be cull. Uh, if i've got birds in there that are beaks are being overgrown i don't want them in my program you know that that to me that's more likely a genetic issue than you know uh, an environment issue especially if it's not happening to all your other birds if it was an environment issue all your birds would have it. If it was something that's more genetic, you know, you might have a few here and there that have it. Uh, Deborah Berg says, I see feathered quail wings for sale on eBay, etc. Feathered skins sold for crafts and fly fishing, I guess. Uh, do you know how to prepare these? I do not, but I have, uh, I've, I've seen the same thing. I would go on one of the Facebook group pages and ask them. I'm sure somebody knows how to do it. Um, Okay, Cooking Sherry's got a good idea. It says, what to do with the leftover parts? Feet and bones are good for making bone broth. Uh, entrails and feathers can be composted. There you go. Richard Burton says, uh, your thoughts on red wiggler worms for high protein? I don't know anything about red wigglers um, as far as protein values. Um, I don't think it would hurt your birds if, if they would eat them. I'm sure they probably would. Um, yeah, that's something, you know, maybe you could look it up on Google it, you know, see what the, the protein values are. But to be honest with you, you know, as long as you're feeding a, a decent feed, like, a, you know, a game bird starter or even a turkey starter or even some of the higher protein chick starters, they're going to do just fine. You know, the, I see a lot of people that worry about protein levels. Everybody thinks I've got to have high protein. I've got to have 30 percent protein. I've grown chicks out on 24% on protein, 28% protein, 30% protein. The only difference you might find is the ones on the lower protein levels might take a, an extra week or so to get up to weight versus the ones that were on the 30%. So. Uh, Sean says, question, how do you sanitize your incubators? Um, for the most part, I spray them down with, I used to use uh, peroxide, then I used vinegar, now I use a, a product called Otoban. Um, I mix it to about, you know, between 30 and 50%, somewhere in there. And I just spray down the entire inside of the incubator, wipe it out real good, and then just let it dry. And it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty well disinfected. 
I also use that same stuff to disinfect my cages. I also use the same stuff, Autoban, to mop the floors of my shop, uh, you know, to kill anything that may be in there, so. Um, RG1599 says, any big difference between the males and females for meat purposes? Well, uh, on a jumbo line, especially the pharaohs, your, um, your hens are gonna run a little bit larger than the males. Uh, but for most people, they want to keep the hens for, you know, egg production, and they'll butcher off all their extra males. But, uh, yeah, the females will weigh a little bit more than the uh, than your roosters do. Uh, Anita's talking. Deborah says uh, wings and pelts can be preser preserved using borax. Absolutely. That's what we used to use in our uh, fish taxidermy days. Dow Choo Choo's in the house. Says, hello, everyone. Greetings from Cuba. Uh, Harry says, hi, Terry. You made a believer in raising Caternix quail out of me. I'm going to buy my first hatching eggs as soon as I can build an incubator and some cages. Well, congratulations, Terry. I'm glad you uh, uh, are jumping into it. Um, good idea, getting everything taken care of first, you know, the cages and your incubator. We do have a good incubator build here on the channel. Uh, if you want to check that out, uh, it can be done, you know, pretty inexpensively. And from all the feedback that I've got on that thing, um, it works really, really well. Tony says, uh, question, I bought leg bands for my quail. At what age can I band them? Um, I mean, I would imagine, you know, from four weeks on, I would, I don't see no reason in banding really young chicks. I mean, unless you know for, the only reason I could see that you might want to band young chicks is if you want to breed two different or you want to put two different bloodlines together or two different hatches together and but you want to know which hatch is which um but yeah i mean basically depending on the size of the band as long as it's not too big to where it'll slide off the chick's leg um, i don't see any reason why you couldn't put it on it you know say anywhere between three and five weeks richard says do double yokers have two birds or how does the double yoke affect the developing chick? I actually hatched out one double yoker, and I was surprised it even hatched. Um, one bird absorbed the other bird. One chick absorbed the other chick, uh, and the chick hatched out with four legs. It was really weird looking, but uh, yeah, usually usually a double yoker won't won't develop, or if they do develop, you'll end up getting a, a weird looking uh, bird like I did, or they just won't hatch. Uh, Steven says, hi, new to the live videos, question, I have three roos and 12 hands, okay, in a 5 by 2 cage, well, 5 by 2 is 10 square feet, um, times, yeah, you could actually go more than that, that's, that's a good, um, a good amount, the only thing I would do is probably maybe get rid of one of your roosters, um, that way, you know, three three roosters gives you a, a one to four ratio, which is okay, um, but you could run into some issues where the roosters get jealous and they, they want to, you know, fight each other for the hens. Um, it might be a little bit easier. It, it'd make it a, a one to six ratio if you went uh, two to 12. So your call, you know. Uh, Andrew says, love this series, Terry. Thanks, absolutely. Annie G says, I'm so grateful to have found you and your videos. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much for sharing all your info and experience. Absolutely. Renacoop, that's the name of the uh, the um, horizontal water nipples that we're using. Still, I still haven't thought of the name of the cups, but thanks, Mark. Renacoop is uh, the one, Jip. Okay, Autumn says, yes, they were all shipped eggs. So, yeah, I wouldn't, uh, Autumn, I really wouldn't complain a whole lot about the what did you say, 12 that hatched uh, out of the 30? Because you're, you're getting close to the 50% uh, the ratio. But I would definitely, the, the 2 out of 60, yeah, that needs to be taken care of, you know. Woman of Spirit says, uh, my quail are two weeks old. When can I take them out of the brooder? How many weeks do I feed the high-protein crumble? Thanks for all your help. Um, I don't know where you're at, and I don't know what the temperatures are. Uh, if they were if if they were at two weeks in my setup, they would already be out of the brooder 
and into draw pens uh, just because being in Florida my weather's you know pretty warm and the chicks can handle it and that two weeks they're getting close to being uh, they're not gonna be fully feathered but they'll have you know the bulk of their feathers um, but I would go um, three three and a half weeks will be safe for you and as far as um, how many weeks do you feed the high protein crumbles? I keep mine on the 30% game bird starter until the hens start laying eggs. Once they lay eggs, they go into layer cages and are put on a 16% uh, layer crumble. Uh, Michael's in the house says, hello everyone. Glad you can make it, Michael. Okay, I've already answered that question. Genuine toe tags in the house, a little late, but hello everyone, glad you can make it. Here's a good one. Michelle says, Deborah, to, to prepare for crafts, I just run them through a dehydrator. That's a good idea. Jill's in the house, says, late. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Woman of Spirit says, if the black soldier flies would eat mosquitoes, I would raise them in all four corners of my yard. Absolutely. Tim Baldridge is in the house from Michigan, says, I'm late, going to start watching now. Happy Friday. Happy Friday to you too, Tim. Cassiopeia, that face looks awful familiar. That would be my niece. Uh, how many quail can I keep in a 4x4 coop? 4x4 uh, is going to give you 16 square feet. Um, depending on how many birds you want per square feet, uh, you need to decide that. I try to stay right around one, maybe one and a half birds per square feet, but you can go up to three birds per square feet. So I would lean more towards the, the lesser birds per square foot. Uh, Stephen Myers says, thought I deleted the first two. Not a problem, Stephen. Uh, Richard Burton says, any pictures of the four-legger? I do have the pictures on my computer somewhere. Um, I will see if I can't dig them out and uh, actually, uh, go to the Caternix Corner Facebook group page and go through the uh, photos in there. I know I posted it on there. I actually posted a short video, too, of him walking around. It looks funny with those those two extra feet. Uh, Tommy says, hello from Aaron, Tennessee. Hello, Tommy. Glad you could make it. Sage Wolf uh, 1975 says, hello, everyone. And... Cassiopeia says, yep, that's me, Uncle Terry. Glad you can make it, Cassie. And I look forward to uh, you getting into quail. And you just let me know when you're ready for some eggs. And I will ship them up to you. All right. That brings us down to the bottom of the list already. Um, how are we doing on 8.30? Wow. We're actually on time tonight. Usually we go a little bit over. So I have to select... Um, I don't think my other moderator's in here either. So I have to select um, a winner for the um, automatic watering nipples and the starter pack. And I think just because he's a nice guy, I think Mark from the La Rochelle farm is going to, uh, to get that. Mark, you know what I need. Uh, I need you to let me know which one you want, the starter pack of the packages, of the cartons, or I would recommend the tees because I'm really interested to get your input on those smaller tees, how well they work. Um, let me know because I may, uh, I may order some of them smaller ones if they work, work out all right. Um, so Mark, just shoot me an email. You know what information I need. Well, I probably already have it, but uh, make sure I get a... Uh, a good email address for you and uh, all your shipping info. Um, let's see. I see a few more questions popping up. Let me go down to them real quick. Woman of Spirit says, here in southern Indiana, still having some nights in the low 30s. Yeah, if, especially if they're going to be outdoors. Um, um, you definitely want to make sure that they are 100% fully feathered. Uh, to handle them low temps, but if they're inside um, You can probably get them off the heat by like I said three to three and a half weeks S. McKee says why are the feathers on many of my birds backs curling up could it be caused by temperature changes? Uh, if they are in your breeding groups, it's most likely from the rooster mounting your hens. I have um in my larger groups, especially some of my ferals. As a matter of fact, 
let me bring up that I think I have a photo in here yeah um, I don't know if you if you can see this this front one here the one closest to the watering cups it's not really ruffled up but I noticed a lot of that is you know from the rooster trying to mount the hen and this this I can tell is an old picture because these are my old uh, wood frame cages so but yeah I mean I've never had a problem with it even even when they were all curled up like that um, I didn't have any issues as far as you know uh, them reducing the amount of eggs they're laying uh, everything was still uh, you know basically going like it was prior to their feathers being messed up I think it's just a bad hair day maybe I don't know Woman of Spirit says, congratulations, Mark. Absolutely. Sue says, congrats to Mark. Uh, Merely. I hope I said that right. Merely. Merely, Marley. Happy Friday, everyone. Sorry if I butchered your name. Michelle says, congrats, Mark. Jason Dyer also says, congratulations. Uh, Adirock Quail and Duck Ranch. Charlie says, everyone hit the like button. Uh, you can do that. We got 50-some odd likes and 50-some odd people in the house, so... Yeah, I noticed, I don't know, maybe today, oh, it's freaking uh, April Fool's. Is people going out for April Fool's? Normally we have twice this many people viewing, so I don't know, maybe uh, maybe April Fool's is the day I should have taken my wife out to do something. I don't know. Uh, Mark says, Terry, I just installed 20 tees. That's all right. You can take 10 of them out and uh, put, put 10 in. Just test them out. Let me know how they work out. Yeah, but he says, luckily I could use some more because I broke some. Yeah, been there, done that. All right, uh, RLM Fishing says, I've learned a lot from you. That's great. Uh, Meyer, Meyerly, oh, I wish I could pronounce it. Meyerly, I guess is what I'm going to say it is. What is the lowest temperatures quails can be if I kept in outdoor cages? We're in North Florida. Um, you're fine. They can handle any weather in northern Florida. Um, I would say uh, the worst thing you would have to worry about is summertime when it gets you know up into the 90s. Make sure they are in a shaded area of your yard. Uh, make sure that they got good ventilation, air blowing through the cage. Um, that'll do a lot for them. But as far as low temperatures, um, you know some of the breeders I've talked to up in northern Canada, they're hitting minus 40 degrees Celsius, which I don't know what that is. Uh, Fahrenheit wise but I know it's cold so yeah they can deal they can work Mark says thank you Terry those will come in handy with the build oh Meyerly, I got it right the first time cool Mark says thank you everyone <coughs> RLM fishing says how would you think about outdoor Michigan weather uh, again um, well actually I have a niece also in Michigan and she keeps her quail outside um, the, the biggest thing is is having a place where they can get out of the weather you know like uh, they can handle the cold but they need to be able to get out of the wind the rain um, you know stuff like that but the, the cold is uh, basically not going to bother them at all so okay guys we are down to the bottom of our questions our alum fishing says thank you absolutely um, so guys uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight um, I hope everyone had a a good uh, April's Fool's Days and didn't get fooled too bad. I had two people get me today, which was kind of funny, I guess. But, uh, yeah. Uh, don't forget to join us Tuesday. Let me check my messages real quick just so I can let you know. Um, okay, he hasn't got back with me yet. Um Join us Tuesday on Caternix Corner Live. We go live um, at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I am trying to get uh, Klaus Marshall to join us. Oh, he might be answering my question right now. Oh, maybe not. Um, he just got his phone back. Uh, Klaus was on here a few weeks back. Um, he wasn't here in person, but he did a recorded voiceover, uh, and he got a lot of questions, and I would like to bring him on uh, just to have him address some of those questions. So, 
uh, yeah, join us Tuesday for that. Join us uh, next week Friday. I will post the uh, subject um, for next week Friday's live, uh, Shop Talk Live, over in the uh, Coternix Corner uh, Facebook group page. Um, okay, Mark says, I will use them side by side with the rent coupe ones. I'm curious to see how the plastic is. Yeah, cool. I'd, let me know, Mark, because if you look at the images, look at the size of that picture. Look at the size of that plunger. It looks twice as wide as the plunger on, on the ones that we order. So I'm really curious how well it works. If it works out good, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call the guy and, uh, and let him know. Uh, RLM fishing. Um, right now, I'm not selling quail. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> peer pressure, Klaus. We need to see him again. Yes, I agree. Uh, but yeah, I'm not selling um, hatching eggs right now. Occasionally, I will, you know, give away a 30 count or so on the live streams. Um, but for right now, I'm basically just cleaning up my lines so I don't really have any extra eggs. Uh, but Michelle says peer pressure, Klaus. I don't know why he hasn't got back with it. He must be sleeping. Okay, details, nails in the house says, hello everyone. Um, or is there a group? Um, RLM Fishing, if you're looking for uh, hatching eggs, check out um, AJ Farms LLC. Uh, I believe that's their website also. Um, Anita and John Garrett have some amazing uh, jumbo pharaohs. Uh, also check out, if you're interested in some colored birds, check out Southwest Game Birds. Um, I don't know if I can, no, I can't pull them up right now. I'm on a different screen. But uh, check out Southwest Game Birds. Um, Michael's got a large selection of birds. Uh, his website is southwestgamebirds.com, and uh, they're really good at shipping. And you'll love the box they ship in. It's, it's pretty classy. So, all right, guys, that brought us down to the bottom of our list. Uh, again, join us Tuesday. Join us next week, Friday. Uh, thank you for joining us today, guys. I hope everyone has a happy April Fool's Day. Um, I want to say a shout out to my niece, Cassie. Thanks for joining us today. I really appreciate it. And like I said, let me know when you want the eggs and I'll get them shipped out ASAP. So guys, have a uh, wonderful night and we'll see y'all on Tuesday. Bye-bye.